My name is Anthony and Exaguru. I'm going to be hosting the um, Poetry Book Society Instagram Live with um, with Hannah and Jack tonight. Jack, uh, Hannah's just come in. I'm moving my camera back. There you go. Um, hello, Hannah. Hello. How are you? How are you? You right? Yeah, not bad. You? Yeah, yeah. Not bad. Another, another day in the office. What's been happening? I've just had a curry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How was that? Really nice. All the uh, fun. But Rory oh, and I, nice. as my food. Oh, nice. That's very good. Yeah, you, the connection's a little bit choppy. I don't know if... Um... Oh, hang on. Let me... Uh... Yeah. Been any better? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we'll see. See how we go. Um, it's a bit blurry, but I think as long as the the sound is good, then um, let then me clean. Right. Back. Yeah. Um, Hannah's just gone off to I think clean the lens, if I heard correctly. Um, yeah, there we go. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's that's great. Um, cool. Well, thanks for thanks for stopping by, and um, and having a having a chinwag about the kids, which I'm holding up here. Um, Hannah's latest book, which was a, a poetry book society choice, um, a wonderful collection of sonnets and memories and anecdotes from her time as a as a teacher working in schools. I think I could relate to this so much because. I think you're a bit older than me, but I still felt the North London-ness of this book, um, being a, a North Londoner myself, born and raised. Um, I a lot of, yeah, go on. That much younger that I might might have taught you. All <laughs> oh, right, I'm, I'm thirty. I'm thirty-eight. So um, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think you. Why? Yeah, yeah. I think a few more years below. Um, but no, yeah, I, I really, I loved it. It was so, I've got a load of questions that I want to, do you want to start by reading something or would you want to close with reading something from it? It's up to you because I've got a load of questions here. No, up. Far away with your questions. What I was gonna, not, what's that? I was going to say in response to that thing about recognising the North Londonness of it. But in the book, I was sort of thinking about how far back in time is history? Because I was t I was teaching in the 2000s, right? Like the mid 2000s, which seems like both very recent and yet is sort of a very different, quite a different time, mm. you know? So. Yeah, and I think, you know, learning has changed, education has changed, um, children have changed, they've become adults now from, you know, the mid 2000s. So yeah, it's definitely, but I think, for me, it really kind of captured captured an atmosphere, like it it captured a kind of uh, a sentiment, maybe like an energy that was very specific to location, which is something that I kind of want to discuss, like your relationship to kind of how they're very social. Like I like asocial poems in which that you can't really tell where they're situated, but these are so social, they're almost the antithesis of sociality within within poems. So I wonder if you could begin by just talking about your relationship to the environment that these poems are born out of. Yeah, well, the, the poems that I think you were talking about, the first sequence in the book, which is um, uh, all about my experience of teaching um, in a sick form in North London. I kind of sort of slightly don't want to say exactly where it was, but I also think lots of people will know. Um, doesn't take much to probably find out. But actually, I remember going back into, so I'd left Ilford where I'd grown up, gone off to university, lived in America, come back home, done my teacher, sort of had a couple of years doing wasting time, and then I'd done my training. So by the time I entered that sick form when I was 23, it felt like I'd never seen anything like it before. I suppose I'd lived in, you know, Ilford where I'd grown up was a, multicultural area but I'd gone to a very white and traditional school and the sit form was certainly the most mixed pl place it was so urban mm. even by my standards of growing up in Ilford it was such an urban environment and one of the things that really interested me about 
the students that I met there, and like I can't generalise about them because obviously the students from all kinds of different backgrounds, but a lot of them, you know, were born in, say, Hackney or Stoke Newington. Very, very rarely left Hackney or Stoke Newington. But if you ask them about their relationship to Britishness, they'd often, and you know, maybe their parents or their, often their grandparents had arrived from somewhere else. They would talk about being Ghanaian or Jamaican or Bulgarian. Because, you know, one of the things that was happening at the time I was teaching, um, we were getting lots of students coming in from Eastern Europe. Mm. As a result of, uh, you know, political unrest and war there. I always found that really interesting to be so of London in my mind, but in, in their own eyes, lots of them didn't see themselves as, as being, of having a, they didn't have a harmonious relationship with Englishness. Mm. Yeah, um, and I, yeah, I, I think we, we spoke about this before, I think somewhere, you know, like the idea of what it means to be British and I think what it means to be English, which, you know, like there's a dichotomy between the kind of two. Um, in that English is perceived as a race and British is a nationality. Um, and I kind of feel that, yeah, that it really, like I felt that I resonated a lot with some of the sen- the political leanings of the poems, like what they were kind of, what they were, the, what they were wrestling with. And I guess it's this duality, this notion of being mixed or being a, t- that everything was in a state of opposition in the poems, which is in the first sequence that I noticed. And I kind of wanted to pick up on that, you know, the power dynamics of teacher student, but the teacher or the speaker in these poems who you assume to be the teacher is very much engaged in that world. It's not didactic. It's not kind of authoritative. It feels that the teacher is part of that community as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the teacher I was was never far from the student that I had been hmm. and you know, that's I wanted to teach at that particular um, level because that had been the age at which I'd had like the most amazing kind of galvanizing experiences in an FE college, so a similar environment. Um, I had very radical English teachers that taught a very enlightening curriculum compared to my very traditional, dusty, white English school, secondary mm. school. And so I was always mindful of that, you know. So you put into this weird position as a teacher because you are sort of all of a sudden meant to assume authority. But I was young. I mean, I was 22 and I started teaching. And I didn't feel like I had much authority in my own life, let alone over anyone else's. Mm. And I think one of the things that maybe doesn't get talked enough about in teaching is that the students teach you too, right? Mm. And yeah. I, well, I mean, not to mention, Anthony, the fact that I'd not done an English degree. So I was often only one step ahead of the, you know, like learning the night before mm. the restoration in order to teach it the next morning. So it felt like often like a bit of a performance. Mm. And yet over the years, I found that I was kind of all right at it. And, you know, I had a good relationship, good, um, you know, a, a nice thing happened in the classroom. Yeah. But I, I never kind of had that didactic authoritarian approach. It just didn't feel earned. Yeah, yeah. And I think... What's the poems in the first sequence? They're asking questions as opposed Mm. to the answers. Yeah. I think that's probably what gives it that feeling of being kind of embedded within the world and that it didn't feel that it was set up as a way of this all-knowing, all-seeing eye looking down on these kind of young immigrant kids and kind of making you know, like judgments or assumptions about their lives and about their, you know, it felt very much part of that, which I really liked. I think it was a su- it was super balanced in that sense. I want to ask you three things, like three really, that things that just kept ringing out as I was, you know, going further and further into the book. The first one is I know that you're uh, a technician and I've read all of your books. We've published on Outspoken Press, uh, The Neighbourhood. And I love, I guess you're, I would say obsession, but, and I mean that in a great way with metric and with kind of syllabic count and with the sonnet in particular. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to form and how poems kind of establish form, uh, particularly predetermined forms like the sonnet uh, and how you go about negotiating that. Yeah, I, I love form and obsession is the right word. I suppose it's like, you know, I, I admire people that write poets that write in free verse. For me, that feels like diving into an ocean. 
Mm. I like a swimming pool with rules and lanes or a bath, maybe. <laughs> it's something that's, I, I like a, a container. And I like what? Why around. is that? Partly it's because time and time again, form has shown me it, it can put, it's partly it's partly about confidence actually because um form has shown me that i can really push my imagination something that i'm not sure that left to my own devices you know because when you have to start rhyming a word or find a me find a metrical line and a rhyme you have to work really hard i mean form is so time consuming it's so labor intensive but it really it pushes you it surprises you all the time mm. um, well, it surprises me all the time. And I know it's, you know, with lots of um, writers, it's not in fashion. And I, sometimes I think people find it so hard. I think it it's partly sometimes pe people are pushing against the canon. I've heard that, you know, particularly the sonnet, which is like the pinnacle of high culture, tradition, all its associations with Shakespeare. But I suppose my response to that is to like take the form and, and make it your own, which is why in these poems I was really trying to get the, you know, my voice across and the vernacular of the students, but also of Ilford, where I'd grown up, the Essex vernacular, all that sort of thing. Mm. And also, uh, partly it's about the fact that in these poems, I was having to teach the sonnet so often and how to get students interested in the sonnet. I thought, well, maybe I'll write some sonnets that I think young kids would find interesting, mm. you know, partly as well. But, you know, bro broadly it's because... It, it, it makes me think in a different way. Yeah. I remember listening to um, an interview, I think it was with Terence Hayes, and after he'd written sonnets for my past and future assassin, and he was saying how the sonnet is very much like a cage. And in the cage, you've only got so many moves you can make, but the invention and the ingenuity is about how you contain yourself within those constraints within those parameters how you move and that's what i guess makes it interesting and then danes smith when they were interviewed on the sonnet sequence in don't call us dead they said that they're the kind of writer who very easily can just write but the sonnet tells you you've got to end on the 14th so knowing where you have to end you just have to work out what you're going to do until you get to the 14th I think both of those like yeah ideas are absolutely true. It is a cage. It is a, it's a cage and it means you can't say that much so you have to work on distilling mm. the idea. but it's also got the most fantastic sense of movement in it right which yeah. is the back pan which you can really put anywhere that you want but traditionally comes you know after the eighth line mm. and that means that the poem has to sink a bit deeper or lift up a little bit higher it can't meditate on one theme and I think the po poems that I love are ones that have got some movement so in the kids I'm either either the movement is a shift in consciousness or revelation but often it was temporal it was like something that happened in the classroom when I was a teacher would take me back to something that happened to me when I was their age or younger or whatever mm. and I just fun to have that to know that's coming it's really an enjoyable part of the writing process. yeah yeah i think uh, yeah that's so true it, it, um i often think that the volta it serves as i kind of my relationship to it is that i think that the reader by that point is bored so by the seventh line they're bored shitless and now you need to do something else like go somewhere else like yeah. literally that whole misdirection and that for me is how I kind of, but I think about them as panic rooms. Like they're so intense. Like a sonnet is so intense that, you know, it's particularly like the Shakespearean sonnets uh, that there's just so much noise and banging and music and sound all happening in those 14 lines that, um, that yeah, like I, I, I'm not massive on writing them, but I do, I enjoy reading them. I think I enjoy me reading them more than I enjoy making them. But, um, what but yeah like a short poem so maybe that's another reason i think terence hayes actually caught, like talks about the panic room in one of those in one of his poems in that book yeah he and, does that's right yeah yeah uh, as well i think in the same poem well the other thing i should say is that they are love poems you know mm. and that energy carries forth you know from shakespeare you know my mistress eyes uh, whatever it is, I like the sun, I can't remember if that's the right line. But it's that whole idea that I wanted to, you know, express it, you know, love to the students that I've taught, to the, my teenage friends, and then in the le later section of the book to my son. Mm. And to 
teachers uh, without whom, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Mm. I think that that's a great segue into the next um, thing that I wanted to talk about was both you and Jack, um, a parent, and you write so kind of richly and thoughtfully about the life of a parent and how, you know, like it's never, a, it never feels a, again, authority, like I'm the parent, this is the child. There's always that symbiosis kind of between the two worlds, the adult world and the world of the child. I wanted to ask, because in later poems in the book, you know, your, your, your son is, uh, it becomes a lot more prevalent. Um, how you go about negotiating those poems uh, around parenthood well, yeah I mean that's a question I haven't actually no one's asked me about this book yet or about writing about him I suppose you know that I, I used to remember when I was teaching that I wasn't you know I wasn't a parent at that time a parents evening would come around and I would meet all these parents who were that bit older than me maybe 10 years older than me or whatever and um, I would also look at them like you know that's an awful lot of responsibility like I've got responsibility for the two hours I've got the child in the classroom but the poems about Rory that they, they, you know they may be full of joy he's actually sat here by the way but he's really <laughs> <laughs> you can hear me <laughs> yeah <laughs> he this. they're they're also about um, a young child negotiating contemporary. We live in Wood Green and resting lively, slightly edgy air. I think in lots of writing about children, there's always anxiety paired with, you know, um, enormous love, but great humour as well. And mm. also, writing about children allows you to slightly traverse into the kind of mystical and magical. So, whereas the beginning, section of the poems are very much kind of socially realist I suppose in the later poems I start to play around a little bit and I send mm. Roy on the moon and you know mm. catch the snowstorm all that sort of thing. How do you go about um, and this kind of this is the last I guess the last thing that I had was I think that you're someone who works exceptionally well across the landscape of memory um, and a lot of those poems are working on or off the back of a memory of some kind. They're always looking back to kind of like negotiate the future. So I, the question that I guess I had was, how do you pick what, because, you know, they feel like events that have happened. It feels, you know, you, you're amazing at life writing. And I think that it has a strong autobiographical element to it. So how do you go about deciding and discerning what it is that you're going to make into a poem? <laughs> I don't know that I that I do think too consciously about it, but I suppose what I do over like all the work now, you know, years of writing. I guess I've always thought that you know that bringing Socrates here, you know, the unexamined life is not worth living. And my, I remember my brother saying that to me when I was very very young. And over the years, that's what I think I've tried to do is try and make sense of my life, which has been confusing and complicated and you know has all kinds of things sitting in the background not least post-war migration and the legacies of you know on my father's side it's a very very complicated stuff um to do with his life in jamaica and i think I, i've just sought to kind of work through use writing as a method of inquiry to process my thoughts and memories i should say that Perhaps one of the lovely things about form is it takes like moments in your life. I think things come to me imagistically, like my memory works very imagistically, but moments in your life that have perhaps been quite difficult or quite painful and to kind of slightly gloss them, give them a bit of, you know, buff them up a bit, you know, mm. <laughs> up a bit with the poem. Um, I don't know that I've got a particularly good memory, funny enough. And so there's so, there's also, as much as I say, like the first sequence, which is remembered, it's 20, 15 years ago, um, is socially realist. It's also huge inven invention going on. So like the students that are in the poems are the focal point of the poems. They're often conflations of lots of different students and things that I present as being a singular moment, like one event in a poem, actually with things that probably happened lots and lots of times, like students telling me they were bored of reading mm. a bit. I mean, that happened weekly for mm. 10 years. I mean, you know, but in the poem, 
you have to make the poem work. So the memory, because it's very different from the memory, in fact. Yeah. It's something, you know, so it's working, it's working with the material of memory, but trying to make something artistic out of it. Yeah, that's really interesting, the material of memory. And again, like we don't, I guess you don't always have to, I mean, you know, honour the memory as it is. Like when I've done workshops with people and they're writing around an event, a lot of people want to actually write what happened to them. And I'm just like, but, you know, it's a poem. So it doesn't, you don't have to honour the event itself. Like the, the, the most important thing is the poem. And so within that, you can embellish, you can move, you can jump, you can do whatever you want to do. Because I think with a lot of people, they conflate kind of poetry with a kind of life writing, like writing their memoirs. Um, whereas like poetry has to have like a lateral element to it, like an elasticity that poetry. distinguishes it from the from prose. Yeah, but I think that one of the things with poetry is that readers become invested in it as being true, right? There's mm. a kind of that. But on the part of the poet, it's not like memoir. Memoir works with, you know, what Philip Lejeune calls the autobiographical pact, which is what I am writing here will be as true as close to my memory of events that I, that I can give you. And it's, you know, it, it becomes litigious when memoirs are discovered to have been fictionalised or completely mm. made in some cases. Poetry does not have those restrictions on it. Mm. And I've never really been interested in the documentary truth because it's too complicated often, or boring, on the other hand, to put into a poem. I guess people talk about the emotional truth. It's become, in my mind, that's become a little bit of a cliche, but that is what I'm interested in. I'm telling you, when I'm writing these poems, I don't even know that I'm lying half the time. I'm, <laughs> but I'm fibbing my face off like in this poem. <laughs> and I, I don't really care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, it's that. It's because it's like you say, people aren't going there for the big reveal of what happened, you know, like it's not a what happened. It's that what it's the, the moment and what the moment suggests and contains. That's what you go to the poem for, like, you know, the thinking work of, of the moment as opposed to like the linear time. Um, but exactly. hmm. what the poem can make of a moment. But I mean, yeah, I mean, even when I write a memoir, I could truth. I had to put a big disclaimer at the front saying, you know, a lot of it was invention. I mean, that was partly to do with what I didn't I didn't know. But memory, of course, is, I mean, it's so weird that memoir, of course, has its et etymology in memory, because memory is so fallible, so unstable, mm. constantly sucks, you know, and I love mm. that in a way. It means that a poem that you might write on one day about something that happened, you know, if you wrote it the next week, it would be a different poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I guess, yeah, there's so much. I know um, I'm a bit obsessed with Percival Everett at the moment, and he, who's a novelist in the States, and he writes a lot about working off memory and how memories are reconstructed, how we reconstruct our own memories all the time. Um, and we're always forming different. So, yeah, I think that that's a really interesting. And the idea of embellishment versus the actual event and why people, you know, how we try to recreate things that happen through poems, but then using poems as you say, as a kind of means of inquiry, as a medium that can take um, questions and tensions and untruths and contradictions, you know, like it's that's, it, that's its facility. And I think poetry out of all the kind of linguistic art forms that, has, that holds that space the best, which is why I think we go to it with those intentions. Yeah, I think your analysis is so interesting. And also, I think maybe there's a there's something about the, the poems as a sequence serving an intention, right? Which is that mm. I wanted to write a book about youth, British identity, um, the legacies of empire, and all of the things. And to some degree, the poems are serving that umbrella overarching purpose. And mm. for that reason, not to mention things getting shifted because of the form. The poems have to serve that intention, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I was aiming for. So I wouldn't yeah. want to go to this book and highlight everything that isn't true because I think there's something in every poem. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And I think that, yeah, that's just, they do. They feel they fit the form. I think the form reflects the thought, um, which is kind of, I think that's when form's working at its, its best. Should we, um, should we close on a reading from, um, from kids published by Blood Act? Poetry Book Society choice. Yeah, I'll 
Uh, yeah, I'll read The Only English Kid. Cool. Page 19. When the debate got going on Englishness, I'd pity the only English kid. Poor Johnny in his spotless Reeboks and blue Fred Perry. He had a voice from history. The no miss, yes miss, no miss, all treacly cockney, rag and bone. And while the others claimed Poland, Ghana, Bulgaria, and shook off England like the wrong team shirt, John brewed his tea exclusively on Holloway Road. So when Asif mourned the George Cross banner swinging freely like a warning from his neighbour's roof, the subway tunnel sprayed with Muslim scum. Poor John would sit there quietly, looking guilty for all the awful things he hadn't done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for, um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I think uh, PBS are going to be putting links to all the books so you can get them on the website there, um, both Jack's, Hannah's and all the other uh, recommendations and highly commended. Um, cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm going to... What's that? Do I leave live and just... I'm going to bring Jack in and see what happens. Um, I... let's, call, let's, let's call Mr Underwood in the house and um, and see what happens. I mean, you can leave or you can hang out. Um, well, I'm not going to listen, but I don't necessarily want to... <laughs> there he is. Yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Anthony. How are you doing? Hello, Jack. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm uh, I'm outside where it's quiet. So that's well, I mean, it doesn't look like I'm outside, but I am in a shed type arrangement. So oh, nice. yeah, but the cat like come in um, and, and disturb things. As soon as I start talking, she um, comes very interested in what's going on. So inquisitive cat. <laughs> Curiosity yeah. killed the cat. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I might kill the cat before, <laughs> if she's too disruptive, but we'll see. I'll move yeah. back. I feel like I'm much closer to the camera than, than either of you two. So yeah, I've just pressed something, and now I'm... Oh, there we go. I'm trying to get rid of all these things that quite uh, put me off. Um, cool. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jack Underwood, for joining us tonight on Poetry Book Society Instagram Live. We just heard from Hannah Lowe. Do I make a good broadcast? That's my broadcast. Terry Wogan. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what i'm going for um so this is jack's book a wonderful book um a year in the new life it's a very tiny little volume but a beautiful book published by faber it was a pbs recommendation um i love this book i always learn from jack's writing um and always interested to see the different ways in which you jack managed to kind of think about the world, refract the world, synthesize the world. Um, really, really brilliant stuff. I guess I want to start by perhaps talking about something that I noticed. I've read this twice. And on the second reading, I noticed how, how self-aware the speakers in these poems were. There was a huge amount of self-awareness. And that was just not just the body, but the way that the body is socialized, the way that it sits in different environments and how it kind of negotiates itself within different spaces. I wonder if you could begin by just talking about your relationship one to, to yourself, but also the speakers in these poems and, and what they signify. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I sort of have, there, there are some poems where I feel like there's less kind of like lyric distance there where I, I'm probably more situating a version of myself in in the speaker but I starting out on a on a poem I often don't know where I'm going to go so I sort of discover who the voice is through writing them and I think that um I certainly don't start off thinking oh this is me you know in the world um and I, I mean I'm I, that's not to say that I'm really caught by surprise um no that, i'm not i'm not often caught by surprise um by who starts talking because i sort of feel like um well i still get to decide what they say yeah yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't, I, yeah I, I think like for example in one of the poems um there's i sort of talk about like these ghosts and the surveillance of these ghosts mm. And obviously I'm not haunted. So there are, certain, there, are, there are lots of like things about the poems, I think, that kind of that counteract 
that automatic attachment that I might have with myself and my sort mm. of lived reality as so I tend to understand it. And there's and that, that that's a kind of wedge a lot of the time between me and what's going on. Um, as for like self-awareness, maybe in editing, I think I'm, I think I probably try and aim for like a lack of self-awareness at the moment of writing. Hmm. Um, yeah. And it's more one of discovery. So maybe that, so maybe if they're kind of, there's an aspect of the poems, which are sort of thinking who, you know, who am I, who am I, who am I, and what am I going to say? Maybe that, <laughs> that comes out of me. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, like, it's one of these things that when you think about it, like, there's not a lot of, there's a lot of kind of soliloquizing, I think, that happens. There's not a lot of straight dialogue, you know, used. Mm. It's by, there's a lot of kind of internal kind of monologues and things like this. The speakers are, are talking to themselves in some kind of very private way. Mm. But I think one of the beauties of the book is that it are those intricacies. You're, you're in the shower, enamored by your bits. Like, it's that kind of thing where <laughs> you're... Like they're so private, but also so public at the same time. And I think what I find really impressive in this one um, and in happiness as well was the way in which you managed to balance introspection, vulnerability, insecurity, but also situate it in a space that feels so public and so plural. And I think it's that marrying of the two mm. that I find really compelling. And, you know, like it really... You, it, it's immersive, like it draws you into that world. Well, I think that's interesting when we think about like the soliloquy, which is a pretty, it's an art that's not like, that's kind of died out of, um, of sort of, of drama and, and cinematography, the small and, and big screen. Hmm. Going off, you know, it's not, you don't get a character, you don't get like, I don't know, um, somebody you know jack bauer on 24 kind of like stepping forward from the action to kind of <laughs> have a um, moment <laughs> yeah yeah and i definitely think of a poem being kind of like i mean i'm aware that there's narrative um and and the poem for and a poems often for me are kind of like stopping narrative and avoiding the obligation towards narrative this happened and then this happened and then this happened partly because that sort of ca causality there's a burden, you know, mm. you've got to kind of, it gives you an order. Um, but largely because I think when you stop, then then you move into an interrogative frame more easily, which mm. of course is what soliloquy does in, in, in like Shakespeare or, or Aria in, in opera, you know, you have the business and then somebody sort of steps forward, um, which, is, which is odd because it's a kind of, it's a moment of stepping forward. Um, but it's also it's often framed as a moment of kind of internal stepping back <laughs> mm. or stepping in. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I did, I do like love Shakespeare's soliloquy. I mean, I really like Richard III. Mm. I was a teenage Richard III, which sounds like a, a memoir, doesn't it? But I was. Um, and, and I love those kind of, yeah. And then some of that, I think maybe like having to try and learn some soliloquies and stuff. Mm actually kind of gave me maybe like an early experience of of being kind of actually lost in language because I had no idea really what what I was saying when I was learning it vague yeah. idea yeah um, yeah what kind of um yeah I don't know I mean I don't think these these don't feel like kind of classic soliloquies but they but they have that I guess there's two things in between the poems. That's what they feel like. It feels like, you know, we've spoken before about the orbital poem, the poem that kind of circumnavigates its subject. And I think mm -hmm. that with a, the way that you write, because there is so much animation in, and there's so much like imagery, surrealism, strangeness, mm -hmm. impossibility, all these things are being kind of compounded. What you end up finding, or for me anyway, what I feel like when I'm in these poems, is that I'm caught between a moment and something has happened there and something is going to happen there. And we're mm. literally in that bit. And what you don't really know what those two things on either side are, mm. but there is this speaker in a similar way to kind of like, you know, we think of Raymond Carver, we think of James Tate, all their speakers are trying to get out of a predicament. And I, yeah. kind, of, I kind of feel that with your work, a lot of those speakers are wrestling with these big tensions. Yeah, I mean, I I think like I've, that's a word that I've kind of been using for a while, and kind of sometimes just kind of offhand, um, 
somebody uh, said that they'd used it. And so I had to go and check to make sure I hadn't plagiarized it. And it turned out I'd been using it sort of, I used it in my PhD, which was like 2000 and Which word is that? Was that the predicament? Oh, predicament, right. Okay. And it's a word that's sort of increasingly sort of been useful to me to think of like, because predicament's kind of like a bit of a fix, a bit yeah. of a jam, a pickle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's also like, um, I think it has, it brings with it, it's kind of like particulars. Mm. Um, and, I, and I'm interested in that idea of like the particularities, the predicament, but it also kind of, so it's a bit situation, but it's also kind of talks about kind of almost, uh, not demeanor so much, but like attitude or um, emotional state. Yeah, and I like the idea of a poem being a place where, which doesn't really know, which kind of finds and announces its predicament, um, mm. and maybe that's partly because that's that's my situation when writing, I suppose. Um, in, un in uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely think. Well, there's a really nice quote by um, now. I think a professor McCabe. I can't remember her first name, um, but she said in a, in a lecture I once saw. Um, she said that uncertainty is the cognitive stance that underpins the interrogative. Mm. So essentially you can't really, you can't really question things. You can't, you know, or, or like no new knowledge gets made if you're referring to the known. Yeah. You have to kind of reach the end point of the known in order to know something new. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Otherwise you're just constantly referring backwards. So. And, and I do sort of feel like poetry is a sort of epistemological um, thing. I think that's its function, really. That, and increasingly, that, that's, that's become a sort of almost a political feeling for me as well, because the world is so dulled by these reductions and, and, mm. and, and narratives and media is kind of highly reductive. You know, everything's a polemic. Everything's yes or no. Even like strategies of like, identity a kind of um the, ins the increasing insistence on 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 terminology um mm. because we're so there's a sort of there's so much complexity about our situation now with our lives online and our sort of hyper connected connectivity um that are actually we're kind of getting a bit hungry for anchors yeah. and tethering and that yeah, yeah. that stops us from um that kind of stops us from from, from actually acknowledging complexity and dissonance and discord. And, yeah. and, and I suppose a poem is a place that can do that, that, can, that doesn't have to make its mind up, that doesn't have to have a narrow standpoint. So, mm. so predicament, uncertainty, they're, yeah. they're, they're reclamations of, of, of experience in, in the face of, of a rather kind of dulled, um, term-driven, yeah. limited conceptual yeah yeah and I, I think it's you know just hearing you kind of talk it, it it reminds me of you know the idea that there's only you know only despots and tyrants speak in certainties you know <laughs> e e everyone else is trying to work something out and and i think taking and being comfortable and I, you know i've read you know, the, the essays and being comfortable in the not knowing for the hope that something new is discovered on the other end of that uncertainty and that might be an extended uncertainty but mm. if it wasn't for the initial uncertainty you wouldn't have had that and but i think like you say because technology because we live in a world that is so comfortable and we have our creature comforts beside us all the time being in a space that we can hold without necessarily having to kind of pander or um give in to this idea of what does this mean or meaning which kind of goes back to what we were speaking about or I was talking about on Twitter the other day the different ways in which you can experience language without having to necessarily know what it means yeah I mean I mean <laughs> um, I try my best and um, yeah I think I mean let's let's really look at like <laughs> we're very confident aren't we um human beings about what is self-evident but like if we actually really go to the kind of what we really know um we know that the brain is is a very highly limited organ that the central nervous system is kind of um 
it's, it's responsible for a, a, a huge like hallucination that we live in and that our senses don't provide us accurate information about the world. They're very limited in their scope. They provide us with an efficient kind of correction to that hallucination um, by a kind of apparatus that's been um, evolved with efficiency in mind, not, not honesty, not truth. So, so when it comes to kind of like, yeah, I mean, not even despots. I mean, I think we're all despotic in our kind of casual, self-evident understanding of what's going on. Um, when it's, you know, when actually you look at the, the furthest reaches of kind of truth and understanding, they're all like quantum mechanics, you know, mm. literally founded. Like if we knew what was going on, the maths wouldn't work. Yeah, or yeah. if you look at like astrophysics, they're like, time might be degrading or slowing down we don't really know maybe time is actually just doesn't exist at all maybe it's mm. just a way of measuring motion so so the, the, the furthest reaches of knowledge are really foggy yeah, um, yeah and i don't see why you know poetry should should kind of not also pay heed to that kind of, as, a, as, a, as a form of language and, and knowledge making yeah um, in search of meaning why it should be any kind of more more um less rigorous really yeah and i guess it's that i guess it's trying to kind of create that dialogue um which i think the book does so well and i was thinking you know how is it that these poems manage to achieve because the poems are impossible like the, the things that happen is in those poems are impossible like they would never happen but somehow they're communicating a message somehow they're communicating um attention a mm. an anxiety a vulnerability but i think what i love and i've said this to you like hundreds of times before so it won't be new but is the way <laughs> and, I, and morgan parker very similar is how you jump and i think you know i said i, I referred to you as a gymnast <laughs> the other day <laughs> when i was just because of yeah <laughs> because of that <laughs> because of that dexterity and the leaps the associative power that a lot of these poems have, which kind of leads into, you know, I mean, I've, I think that you're an amazing imagist and the way that you can kind of coral in these different ideas and put them all together, but still hold a speaker and hold a speaker that doesn't feel pompous. And I guess I'm not trying to gas you now. I'm going to land on something. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it's the idea that when you go about constructing these images, because I watched an Anne Carson interview where she spoke about how she comes about um, through these associations. What's the process? Is it subconscious? Is it just you sitting there and letting the brain just be playful and move around and see what comes out? Yeah, usually it is that. Um, there's some kind of like, maybe occasionally some kind of notes towards poems. And I think, oh, I've got this idea, or I've got this word that feels right but it's never really more developed than that i like the idea of kind of like the arithmetic of a poem and that um and, and the mind wants to do it actually i i kind of it's not i i think the mind does want to do it if you put a an olive into a black space with a rat you know you've got a sort of you've got a predicament you've got the rat's probably going to sniff it eat it now, if you put a hammer next to a rat, you know, we're worried about the rat. You know, it's kind of, you remove the rat from the situation and put some baby oil and you're in a completely different, strange kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what, what are you doing with the hammer? <laughs> like, um, so you get those kind of little bits of inference and associate that connectivity the brain wants to do. Yeah, um, yeah. And you're just kind of giving it what it wants, I think. But for me, it's like, it can't always be playful. I, I let my brain do that. And I'm very, and I've kind of maybe trained my brain to do that a little bit more, or I've been given permission by writers like, um, well, probably people like Lisa Jarno, Holly Pester, Morgan, yeah, T. Morgan Parker as well. And um, lots, and Kate Killerly, Emily Berry, lots of my contemporaries as well as perhaps some of the strange people, Ray Armand Trout and, um, Rachel Allen as well. Um, yeah, just kind of like the permission that I've given myself and needed to give myself time and again, actually, because I think the pressure is to kind of make, make more kind of tangible sense. And so 
I'm, I'm used to doing that, but I'm always like aware that it can be frivolous, that that's kind of a, a, a play, mm. uh, that's just a, a sense of play. So there has to be something at stake. And yeah. maybe that's where the kind of the artifice of that soliloquy situation, the artifice of that voice, um, maybe where it finds its intimacy, because I think, yeah, if it's just sort of sur surrealism can seem a bit kind of decadent and, and self interested. Mm. Um, you know, ah, oh, ha, 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 here's a, here's a gopher wearing a fez using chopsticks, you know, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like whatever you want. Um, but I think, I think that, I think it, what I think the difference is, is that, and I was listening to Wayne Kostenbaum talk about this as well. You know, he was talking about Henry James and, and that the idea of using impossibility for impossibility's sake. And he was talking about difficulty in poetry, you know, difficult poems, mm. poems that are hard to kind of get into. And he was saying the difference is, is that though he feels anyway, uh, Kostenbaum was saying that when a poet is being difficult for the sake of difficulty, that's when it's not interesting. I guess it's mm. what you're talking about with surrealism. If you're being a surrealist for the sake of surrealism, it does feel quite kind of aggrandizing and, and self-involved. Whereas having like a through line or having a kind of purpose or a mission of trying to resolve or get out of gives the poem that multi-dimensional element that I think a lot of people are on board. And then those themes become uh, as, a, as a, a kind of means of achieving the subject or realizing the subject rather than it being a surreal poem, you know, which I, I like you say, people can get tired of. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there is some value in just, in just play. Um, and, and often like you have to kind of be, like I say, you have to give yourself permission to, to do that in language as well as idea to sort of explore. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I think the most, the most difficult thing for me in poetry is sustaining interest when i know roughly where i am and what's happening and and how somebody feels about it emotionally ethically so what do you do do you shoot off i'd never get myself in that situation because i don't because i don't feel like that's when when i write a poem but yeah when when something's narrative and it's tidy and it's kind of too symmetrical no yeah or too literal you know mm. um an anecdotal and or nostalgic or you know when it's kind of that's fine like if I'm reading a poem like that by somebody else as much as like if, if, if I find myself doing that I just kind of feel like well that's all right that's you know in a, a nice elegant language mm. but um where's the learning and where's the, the I was just like this isn't reality this isn't a reality I recognize I just feel like immediately like that that's actually more more artifice, that realism requires more artifice because of the sense of control and rigging that, that, it, that, it, that it has to bring to play. Hmm. Um, that seems to be more artificial than, That's a interesting, kind of, yeah. than a kind of, than a, I mean, like literally what the hell is going on? Like, yes, yeah. really, that how, to me, I don't mean how, that in a kind of like, wow, man, I just mean, I just feel like that, that the, but it's capturing that, right? Like, I think that you either write because there's something you want to say or you write because there's something you want to find out. And, yeah. I, and I kind of feel that when you go in with that, with that, what the hell's going on and the, the function of the poem becomes a space that can hold the question as opposed mm. to look for the answer, that's when I think it starts to get really, for me, anyway, very interesting. Um, let me just take these out. These have run out of battery um can you still hear me all right yeah 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 You're nice. um the the thing that i wanted to ask before we get into the um into the reading similar to the question that i asked hannah is again a lot of these poems center your daughter center uh, fatherhood um as the essays do as well um what is your how do you approach that you know, like, is it a conscious move to go and write about your daughter or is it in the way that some of the other poems, you know, the more kind of like internal poems happen? Yeah, I, I was, I'm certainly resistant or I was resistant to the idea of kind of writing about becoming a father 
or writing about my daughter and having her as this you, you know, this new love interest. <laughs> um, I was resistant to the kind of inevi inevitability of that, uh, particularly when other people said it was kind of an, an inevitable. It's like, you know, well, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but of course it was, it was um, not unavoidable, but um, yeah, you just have a kind of, but you're so overwhelming, you know. It didn't it didn't make me particularly happy. I had I had a difficult time of, of early fatherhood, um, and I suffered terribly from anxiety and then really low periods of just being completely exhausted by the worry of it, really. Um, and I think in that that created a kind of very emotionally raw state. Um, but of course, so so a lot of the poems are sort of conceived out of that rawness. Um, or in that place, and or or a kind of and a, and a sense of like of exhaustion from the worry, or actually a kind of like a an unstoppable unspool sort of unspooling of, of various worries. So there, there there's lots of sort of yeah they're in those two states maybe, and 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 that's when I would kind of maybe those are times when I when I wrote more. I had less time to write, so I wasn't stewing so much. Um, I just had to kind of like make a note on my phone. And sometimes I'd do that to escape the situation, I think, like mm -hmm. mentally. Um, and so those are kind of stranger poems. But sometimes I kind of needed to to to, to resituate myself where I was or in or in the or in the um the depth of those feelings. So it's hard to say there's Hard to say, yeah. Um, how you know what my approach was? Only that kind of like I've always kind of been a love poet, I suppose, and this enormous the presence of this enormous new kind of love in my life was, you know, almost too much to bear. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so there was there was ready for um, for sensuous overflow, like a kind of like Dante and the Vita Nova, of course, which is the new life. So it's a nod there to, um, to, to, to Dante. I mean, he's pathetic in that, he's in, in that book. He's, he's rendered utterly hopeless and he's a real emo. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, so maybe that's there. Um, I don't know if that really answers the question. I suppose for me, it was just, and continues to be, like uh, an enormously kind of joyful but worrying business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. I know, I know exactly where you're coming from. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Shall we, we hear a poem from, um, from the book? Yeah, I'm sort of, um, sort of toying with which ones to read, really. Um, read all of them. <laughs> in, in six minutes. In six minutes. <laughs> Uh, I'll read, um, I'll read My Body is a Good Body, maybe. Is that the one where it's, um, I'm looking at my, my bits in the shower? No, I th that's the, um, the saint one. That's, that's where the guy gets beatified. I don't think he's actually in the shower. I think he just does it. Oh yeah, I spend that afternoon staring at my bits and ammo. It's just, yeah. it's just, uh, a telling uh, reading of your own there. Isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> the look at my bits is in the shower. Well, that's the place to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's... <laughs> so, um, right. Uh, yeah. And I suppose this is a, yeah, maybe maybe one of the things that happens, that I, yeah, a certain sense of my own body, my own mortal body, something that's now going to, it's now bent in service to this new love yeah. um, and this familial situation and, you know, like that real sense that you're just programmed now to, as a kind of meat buffer, <laughs> there's some whirring machinery that you've got to plunge your hand into or like you've got to stick your head under the pot of oil that's falling to save your child. You just do it without question. Yeah. Um, and I think this is kind of a poem about that strange which is essentially a kind of a suicidal idea idea ideas that what's, i can't even say it idea. idealization yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, or at least one of kind of like uh, uh, these idea 
ideations of, of, of harm. Mm. My body is a good body, a wild instrument and family meal, tender and attentive slap up mammal, steadying a shelf. And with my free hand in your hand, my body is meanwhile meat, stress eating granola or carrying your unique weight across the afternoon, all systems failing in threat computation, stumbling hungry from the churn of froth moustache and prehistoric horn erect, top orca, bullock of the moon, punished god, quiet and blurry on the sofa, the cartoon's happy ending got my throat all thick. Listen, darlings, death is always better prepared than we are, a boy scout of coincidence, an indeterminate religion. So I'm not going to sit around here all day not being sentimental. I am nothing but yours to take and take, this unholy loaf, this boat, a boy stood on its burning deck, suddenly grown up, waving at you. Oh, that's beautiful, man. That's fantastic. That line, um, death is always better prepared than us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He's busy, too. Yeah, he yeah. Up very early. That's yeah. great. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I, I love the, the, the sound. I, I haven't heard you read that one. And just listening to that, the music, the acoustics of the poem. Um, yeah, superb stuff. Cool. So that's Jack's book, You and New Life, available, um, published by Faber and available on the PBS website. I think you'll have some links to all that kind of stuff. Um, that's it from us. We've hit our eight o'clock mark. Well, 1957, but that will, that will do. Um, I don't know who we're going to interview on the next PBS um, insta book club we'll have to work that one out but um yeah we'll definitely be doing this again thank you everyone that's a good turnout 40 odd people um came and, and locked in on that so yeah fantastic jack i'm gonna see you on uh, thursday at yes Alcon. can't wait is um is this available to watch again is it going to be on the poetry book society Instagram yeah. TV. That's right. I'm going to put it up now. So once we finish, I'm going to upload it and it will be there for people to watch back as and when they wish. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Lovely. Lovely to see you. Good to see you. I'll see you soon. Yeah, man. Take care. See you, yeah, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yes, Bye.